watchers in the fourth dimension. You wish to fight the will of Omega? Awkward, isn't it? Careful, Jerry, baby. Three of them. I didn't know when I was well off. Hello and welcome back to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension. I'm Anthony. I'm Don. I'm Julie. And I'm Riley. And are we going to take this attitude to my music all the time? This episode, we're kicking off Season 10 with a bang as we discuss the return of two very familiar faces in The Three Doctors. But before we get into that, Don is going to take a very quick look at the mail. Take it away, Don. We had several comments regarding our episode on the mutants. Darren Walker said, I actually really like the mutants. We did too. Kieran James Evans says, It's not perfect, but I like this one. Maybe having the VHS early on helps with that. I'd give it around a 6.5 to 7. 6.5 or 7 of what, Kieran? (laughs) I'd certainly prefer it to the Time Monster. Doctor Who 60s, 70s, and 80s says, Another great episode as usual, guys. Thank you very much. Other people have probably already mentioned it, but a mutt costume turned up later in the fourth Doctor story, The Brain of Morbius. Well, that'll be cool to see. A beard obedience says another fantastic analysis, and I think Don nailed the serial down with the discount Thulsa Doom remark. Thank you. Once I saw it, <laughs> I couldn't unsee it. And also on Facebook, Nathan Laws sent us the complete score for the Sea Devils, which I think may be considered an act of war in some nations. <laughs> But I am attempting to sit while I work and listen to the entire thing out of context of the episode just to see what I think of it. And that's the mail. For all of our listeners, we will put the link to that in the description for this podcast episode in case anyone wants to inflict pain on themselves (laughs) willingly. (laughs) Up to you guys. Anyway, thank you for all of that, Don. As a reminder to our listeners, we love hearing from you. We love getting your feedback, thoughts, comments, questions, and we do try to read them out on the show. So please do get in touch. As always, you can contact us through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at at Watches4D, or you can email us at Watches4D at gmail.com. On to the three doctors, because given the nature of this story, there's quite a lot of behind the scenes information here. Planning for this one basically started as soon as the production team was given the green light for the show's 10th season. Producer Barry Letts and script editor Terence Dix once again sought some sort of gimmick to open the season with. If you remember, they had the introduction of the new Doctor in season 7, introduction of the Master season 8, season 9 they brought back the Daleks, so every season has had that kind of hook. Letts had often been encouraged to develop a storyline in which Pertwee's Doctor met his two predecessors, but had heretofore dismissed it as lacking broad appeal. However, he came to acknowledge that this would be a fitting way with which to begin celebrations of the show's 10th year. Letts and Dix also made the decision that it was time to bring the Doctor's exile on Earth to an end. Yay! (laughs) Of course, this was something that they had been left with by their predecessors, and they had been experimenting with various ways of having more off-world stories over the past couple of seasons, and now wanted to make that something that they could do without having to put contrivances in the plot. Dix had discussed this proposal, bringing back the prior two Doctors and ending the Doctor's exile, with our new favourites, the Bristol Boys, that is Bob Baker and Dave Martin, as soon as they had wrapped up work on the mutants from the prior season. The duo initially submitted an idea entitled Death World, in which the Time Lords would be in conflict with the Federation of Evil, which would be led by a manifestation of death himself. To prevent open warfare, the idea was that the Time Lords would have sent the three Doctors into the Federation's limbo-like underworld domain, where they would have had to fight various representations of death, such as the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and the Hindu goddess Kali, in order to determine whether the Federation or the Time Lords would prevail. Now, while the Bristol boys were busy working on their storyline, the production office approached both William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton to confirm their interest in returning to the show. Hartnell quickly agreed, while Troughton indicated that due to other commitments, he would not be available until November 1972. To accommodate this, the serial was pushed to third in recording order for the season, The second story, Carnival of Monsters, had already been recorded as the last story of the previous production block, while the third serial of the season, Frontier in Space, was recorded as first in this production block so that the three Doctors could be pushed back. In addition to sounding out Hartnell and Troughton, Barry Letts and Terence Dix also went to John Pertwee to make sure that he approved of his predecessors returning to the show. He agreed, with the proviso that his Doctor remained the primary focus. (sighs) With all three Doctors confirmed, the Bristol Boys started work on a totally revamped storyline. 
the main enemy became known as Ohm, which is who, upside down and backwards, as they wanted the character to be the opposite of the Doctor. Letts was soon contacted by William Hartnell's wife, Heather, who told him that the actor's arteriosclerosis was having an increasingly severe impact on his memory. As a result, our writing duo were asked to keep the first Doctor's involvement to just a few scenes. At this point, Dix also requested that they included a role for Fraser Hines as former companion Jamie, and touted the possibility of a romantic subplot between Jamie and Joe. Uh, no. (laughs) (laughs) I deliberately paused to get your reaction there, Julie. (laughs) Anyway, as further revisions were made, Letts and Dix requested further changes. Letts felt that the Death World setting was not appropriate for Doctor Who, and so the writers came up with the idea of a realm on the other side of a black hole. And they also introduced the creatures that are known in the scripts as the Gel Guards. More on them later. Let's also didn't like the name of the villain being Ohm, as while the show was called Doctor Who, that was not the name of the character, regardless of what the closing credits may say. The villain was duly rechristened as Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And with these changes in motion, the serial was formally commissioned under the name of the Three Doctors. And during production, it would become the Black Hole before finally reverting back to the Three Doctors again. In writing their scripts, the Bristol boys kept the majority of the scenes with the First Doctor back for the final episode, where he would join his successors for a final confrontation with Omega. However, on further consultation with Heather Hartnell, it was realised that any amount of studio work would be too much for the ailing actor and Dix rewrote the script so that the First Doctor would only ever appear on the TARDIS scanner, allowing for his material to be pre-recorded in a single day in a setting where he could sit and read cues for his lines. Sadly, this would be his last acting role before he passed away just two years later. During pre-production, it also became clear that due to his ongoing commitments on Emmerdale Farm, Fraser Hines would not be available for recording. Initially, his role was to be re-scripted and given to Captain Yates, But that idea was also scuppered when Richard Franklin was unavailable due to commitments to theatre work. With that, Sergeant Benton took the role that was originally planned for Jamie, albeit without the romantic subplot. Despite this, the production team hoped that either Fraser Hines or Wendy Padbury might make a brief cameo appearance for the story's conclusion. This was actually prevented by John Pertwee, who intervened because he felt that too many returning characters might detract from the show's current cast. Sorry, Julie. (laughs) Fine, everything is fine. (laughs) Assigned as director, we have Lenny Main, who returns to the show, having previously directed season 9's The Curse of Peladon. Joining him on the creative team, we have a plethora of returning talent. Dudders comes back, making his 23rd contribution to the show as composer. Roger Limington makes what is technically the first of his contributions to the show, at least in credit order. He had already worked on the next serial, Carnival of Monsters, which had already been recorded. James Aitchison returns to the show for what's technically his third outing, having previously worked on The Mutants as well as on Carnival of Monsters. If you remember from our show on The Mutants, he's the one who goes off to do Brazil, Time Bandit, Spider-Man, Daredevil, and all these big Hollywood movies. So big name there. And yet he came up with the Gel Guards. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Rehearsals for the serial brought up some tension between Pertwee and Troughton, who each had very different acting styles. Pertwee liked to be word perfect to the script, while Troughton had a tendency to ad-lib when he couldn't remember his lines. And that very quickly led to Pertwee getting frustrated. Troughton eventually agreed to respect his colleague's style of working in deference to Pertwee's role as the current star of the show. And the two eventually went on to become good friends. All's well that ends well. The serial itself was broadcast between the 30th of December 1972 and the 20th of January 1973. The final episode drew in nearly 12 million viewers, which was the show's highest viewed episode since the penultimate episode of The Web Planet, all the way back in March 1965. Oh. Nothing beats The Web Planet. With that, we move into our short summary, which is with me this time around. The Bristol Boys, who, by the way, should never be allowed to give lessons in astrophysics come up with a crisis so contrived that the Time Lord's only way out is to bring back the show's prior stars. This serial gives us a villain so angry with, well, everything, but even the destruction of his body isn't enough to stop him, complete with his apparent obsession with things made of jelly. Benton is wonderfully down to earth and the Brigadier goes a bit loopy. (laughs) Finally, crisis resolved, everyone goes back in their separate directions and we're all happy. It shouldn't work, but this is a delightful way to celebrate the show's 10th anniversary, 
albeit about ten and a half months too early. Let's talk about it. Episode one. Well, the title's a bit spoilery. <laughs> yes, it is. Just saying, I think it would have worked a little bit better as a surprise. Yep. I mean, my first my first reaction was, oh boy, I know what this means. And yes, everyone, I realized before watching it that Jamie wasn't going to be in it. It's fine. I was just excited for Troughton to be back. For a while, you weren't believing me when I told you he wasn't going to be in it. One can hope. <laughs> One can dearly hope. We didn't get Jamie, but we did get the return of the comedy yokel and yeah. his wife. Right at the very beginning. And he survives. Spoiler. I was shocked. <laughs> He survives, and he looks like a little bit like a bushier Art Garfunkel. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> does. Well, that's an unexpected connection. It is. <laughs> On a, an unexpected for me, anyway, serious note. I did like at the beginning how there is this complete lack of music, and they're shooting on location. It actually gave it a nice sense of realism right at the beginning. There's a lot of that going on with the music where there were a lot of decisions of made when to place it. And I thought it was well done. Yes. There was actual melodies going on. I actually enjoyed the music this time. I thought it was good. It's so much better than some things we've gotten in the past. So, yes, I agree. But you say that it's not offensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not offensive. That's our bar. It's a low bar for dudders. <laughs> yes. We meet Dr. Tyler. Doesn't he just look like a scientist? The tweed, the cardigan, the moustache. Yep, very, very stereotyped. But I liked him. I liked the fact that he is, one, a scientist who's actually like a scientist and willing to learn from other scientists and never gives like the doctor much crap. He's just like, please teach me, teach me more. And I have really enjoyed that aspect of him. He's very independent. Yeah. As we see later on. And also one of the more confusing elements of it right off the bat he immediately just gets on the phone to unit i don't know if that's a number that's available for everyone to just call them <laughs> up on the phone that makes it even more confusing is that then the brigadier seems upset that he's there and making himself at home right and it's supposed to be a top secret place and then later on when the doctor and joe go out and come back they have literally passed by a sign saying this is unit headquarters and yet it's supposed to be a top secret place I guess on the inside, I guess, that they don't want somebody wandering around inside because they might see something. I don't know if it's that top secret, that important. Don't put a sign out front. Don't do that. One, honestly, I think that the work that he does probably is what ties him into going to unit. I forget exactly what he says that he specializes in, but it sounded like something that would go up that alley. So that's kind of how my, I headcanoned it. They've clearly set up a 1-800-888-UNIT hotline. <laughs> <laughs> Seen something strange? Give us a call. We're ready to believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the scene where he is in the lab with the Doctor and Joe and Lethbridge Stewart. They're talking through it all and the Doctor asks for a silicon rod and just uses it to stir his tea. <laughs> Lethbridge Stewart has some snark to Dr. Tyler. Oh, make yourself at home. We're only meant to be a top secret security establishment. There's just such a nice range of banter here. The Brig seems to be in a mood. Oh my God, this yes. Cereal. <laughs> yes, he, he does. woke up on the cranky side oh, of the bed this morning. And his Goodness. day just gets worse. Now there's two of them. <laughs> <laughs> we very quickly lose Dr. Tyler. We get something we've never had before, and that is malevolent alien creature breaching unit hq that's quite the change and this episode is moving at a lightning pace yes can we talk about that blob because what was happening we well, see all the cso from previous seasons has come <laughs> back for revenge <laughs> <laughs> i don't really understand what they were trying to go for i think it was supposed to be some sort of weird like plasma otherworldly yeah. creature but they had about a buck fifty, and it's hard to do. I mean, I actually kind of liked it. I just went with it. I knew it was the best yeah. they could do on the budget. I could kind of see what they were going for when they had it go down the drain. To your point, Don, it's doing cosmic horror without having the money to do cosmic yeah. horror. <laughs> Which is not great. On the other hand, you get the gel guards who, was this sponsored by Clearasil? Because it's the only, why are they covered in zits? What is happening? It's the color out of money. <laughs> <laughs> the other creatures because you know i love talking about creature design i guess i liked how they looked they kind of looked like exploded pizza rolls a little bit from a distance <laughs> but the sound design i love the noises they make i thought that was 
wonderful. I love the guards' reaction to seeing them. Holy Moses, what's that? <laughs> um, can I nominate him for our future worst supporting actor? <laughs> yes, you can. Good, because I'm like, I'm not buying it, dude. That's terrible. I love some of the lines that were, were done, though. They were just so fantastic. Obviously, Troughton gets most of them, and I have a whole bunch of them captured, and we'll get there. But I think they did a lot better job of having more fun with the script. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, you look at Benton's reaction to when they have to run into the TARDIS to escape the blob. Aren't you going to say it's bigger on the inside? And he just, well, it's kind of obvious, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> like, <sighs> he's so down to earth. Although yeah. he is standing there with a big dumb look on his face the whole time, but then just like brings <laughs> himself together like, nope, it's obvious, it's fine. Yeah. I love how they show the difference of reactions between him and the Brigadier, though, because Benton, he's much more practical. He sees it and he's like, well, I just got to believe it because that's what I'm seeing. Whereas the Brigadier is like, Oh, it's another trick. Doctor, what Optical are you illusion. doing? <laughs> and also thinks he's wasted unit money on it. Yes, yes. <laughs> His reaction is to get mad because he <laughs> built this impossible place. How dare you, sir? <laughs> Let's get to, I know what we all want to talk about. Because this is such a big thing, the Doctor has to call in the Time Lords for help. They themselves are struggling with the energy drain from this antimatter universe through this black hole. So instead of sending a Time Lord, they send in a past Doctor. And that's where we get Troughton in colour for the first time. Another thing too, though, is one of the first things they say is you cannot allow him to cross his own time streams. We all know you can't cross the streams. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Had to. But yes, we get Troughton in color, and it's beautiful and glorious, and I love him. And the first thing he goes on about is the recorder. The recorder and the redecoration of the TARDIS. Which I agree with him. He's like, what have you done? <laughs> I agree, Troughton, I agree. Speaking of that, we get another TARDIS redesign this serial, since the one in the Time Monster was so abominably shit. <laughs> and it fell apart in storage. I think it warped in storage so they couldn't use it, but... I actually like this TARDIS interior. It's got that um, that translucent wall with the scanner on it that's a lot more like Hartnell's TARDIS. Mm -hmm. It's better. And there's no wallpaper wall. <laughs> no. Finally. Uh, also, Benton reaction to Troughton is one of my favorites. He's just like, oh, you're back. And he's like, they're besties. And I loved it. <laughs> yeah. I I'm sure you, much like me, wanted to spin off. <laughs> yes again big finish if you're listening yes. Troughton and the Benton Adventures let's make it happen this is what the purpose of this entire serial is is getting these characters together getting these people in a room these characters that we all like that you know haven't met before or haven't seen each other in a long time question for you guys when do we think Troughton and Hartnell's doctors were taken from in their timeline for me, Hartnell, it kind of looked like, I always forget the name of it, the one with the French Revolution. The Reign of Terror. Reign of Terror. It kind of looked like could have been from the Reign of Terror. Yeah, that's a good guess based on the video. I'm not sure about Troughton, though. That one was harder to figure out. It kind of reminded me of War Games, but I could be completely wrong. This is where we get super nerdy, and Don is aware of this series, so he for once is not going to roll his eyes at me. But there is a concept <laughs> in fandom known as Series 6B, which happens technically after the events of the War Games, where a shady agency within the Time Lords called the Celestial Intervention Agency basically pluck him out before the Time Lords force him to regenerate and have him run missions for him. So the fan theory is this is one of those. Wait, the Celestial Intervention Agency, the CIA? Yes, really? Yes. The CIA. Oh, <laughs> no. I'm okay. fine. I have my own headcanon about a, a kind of a series 6C, so it's all good. Not being <laughs> C. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think from the story, you kind of see that wasteland with smoke rising. It could very easily be the World War One zone in the war games. Let's talk about Hartnell's appearance. The first Doctor is sent in because the second and third Doctors can't get along and they need someone to basically force them into it so they throw in the grumpy old man <laughs> yep <laughs> to tell them what to do i gotta admit as much as it was nice to see him it kind of broke my heart to see him in that state i agree this was one that was really interesting watching it as an adult versus watching it as a child as when i saw this the first time when i was like seven or eight years old because knowing that he was sick and looking for it and, and all of that you really do see it yeah and 
You're right, Don. It is heartbreaking. It's not that hard to see either. I mean, he's not really delivering his lines in the way that he used to. Part of that is what was happening to him, and part of it is the fact he's acting to nothing. Mm-hmm. And then the other actors are trying to time their thing to go with them, but it just it made me really sad. And his scenes were filmed before Pertwee and Troughton even went into rehearsal. So they had all of his footage available for rehearsal so that Troughton and Pertwee could rehearse while reacting to him on the TV, basically. They managed to polish that, but you're right, it's it's kind of rough watching him like that yeah. and seeing him very obviously reading cue cards. But as far as something that didn't make me really sad, I'm pretty sure the second Doctor cheated on that coin flip. <laughs> oh, the third doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I don't want to sit here and like go on and on about how amazing I think Troughton is, but I'm just going to say it once at least, and Troughton just shines again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm completely with you. I have actually, in my notes, I need to hold back. On the Trout and Praise. <laughs> and I don't want it to come across as bashing Pertwee, because we've all come to appreciate Pertwee over the past couple of seasons. But I love Trouton's approach to the character. You mentioned the coin toss, Don, and that leads us neatly into our cliffhanger. Since he loses, the third Doctor has to go out. Joe runs after him, and they both get zapped. That leads us into episode two, which, for a change of late, has a really nice short recap. <laughs> oh, it was beautiful and glorious. I'm so glad it wasn't like a minute and a half. I thought you were going to say for a change, we have a really nice quarry. <laughs> oh, we'll get to yeah. the quarry. We will get to the quarry. Not quite there yet. I do want to call attention to the fact that the third Doctor and Joe have been zapped away. This gives basically the Troughton and Benton show. And the Brigadier coming in and having a meltdown. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There is a fan theory out there that everything that goes on in this serial drives the Brigadier kind of do lally. <laughs> After this, the United Nations just kind of humor him and give him a few men and just kind of <laughs> let him keep going. <laughs> but he's gone bonkers. As we get the remaining unit stories across the rest of the third Doctor's run and the beginning of the fourth Doctor, I will be very curious to see whether or not we think that that theory holds. There might be something to that, just because when the character was first introduced, he was very unflappable. Nothing phased him. And here, he spends a lot of time just sort of like staring into space and looking slack-jawed <laughs> at something and then either completely denying it or getting pissed off that it exists. <laughs> I think they should call it the Pink Panther Theory because it's very similar to how Inspector Clouseau drove Chief Inspector Dreyfus insane in the Pink Panther movies. <laughs> Same exact idea there. Another thing I wanted to touch on is they originally wrote things with Jamie in mind and then they had to rewrite and they ended up rewriting it with Benton. But what I like about it is that it still works with Benton. Yes. Mm-hmm. They play off of each other really well. It's not quite white to the level as with Jamie, but you're not going to get that because I think they had something that was like unnaturally like good between the two of them. Oh, yeah. But just seeing Second Doctor and Benton just having a grand old time and oh, I just loved it. I think that says a lot about Patrick Troughton as an actor, that he can just come in and build that rapport. His screen time with John Levine in The Invasion wasn't that significant. While John Levine had been around on set as various monsters in the Troughton era, they didn't really bounce off of each other in the way they do here. And Troughton just gets right into it. It's wonderful. He did the same thing with Joe, though. Yeah. Yeah. In that one Mm. little scene, it was like, okay, that can totally work. It's awesome. It's called charisma. (laughs) (laughs) Look it up. (laughs) I think there was a question... Was it for a retrospective where someone made the comment about the third doctor being the establishment doctor? And I couldn't help but notice in this episode, I mean, the Brigadier was, as we already covered, completely cranky. But it did feel like the Brigadier prefers the third doctor of the second doctor. Did anyone get else that sense? Yes, but I think that's almost a little bit of Stockholm Syndrome. He's got so used to... <laughs> well, The third Doctor's been around for three years on Earth at this point, if you take one season to be a year. Whereas he had had adventures with the second Doctor on two occasions with the Web of Fear and the Invasion. So you look at the number of times that he's fought various alien menaces off with the third Doctor versus the second Doctor, they've just got a lot more experience together. Hmm. I think the other thing too is that the third Doctor has also kind of learned how to deal with Unit. So I think he probably acts a certain way. 
in front of them, whereas Troughton's just like, I don't care, and does his thing. Yeah, I mean, he's a chaotic, and to use the stereotype, cosmic hobo, basically. He's got that agent of chaos thing that the third Doctor doesn't. Yeah, he delights in certain things happening. Gets very excited where the third Doctor would get worried or concerned. He's very mercurial. Yes. Yeah, that's a good word. So we get to see the Time Lords in their fancy new outfits again. I did like the guy where he gave the line of, the law will be obeyed later when talking about <laughs> the Doctors. One of them was one of the Time Lords in the War Games. Well, that's oh. cool. So that was a nice little bit of symmetry. I think they amended the law. They can't cross their own time stream unless it's an anniversary or a special <laughs> episode. And then <laughs> It's just when the plot needs it. Mm -hmm. The second law being don't feed them after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> but when does that reset? Is it 4 a.m.? Is it 6 a.m.? They're Time Lords. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we also have the third doctor and Joe went to the other end of the light beam to the black hole in which Joe's kind of right in that they're dead, right? Joe assumes she's dead a lot. <laughs> but like when you heard someone explaining it, it it's like well actually if they're if they're on the anti manor world then they actually are technically dead that was weird death is an endless gravel quarry <laughs> omega makes some comments about having found a way to prevent the explosion or some i i don't know julie it works somehow <laughs> the science not that strong <laughs> yeah but Quarry, quarry! Yeah! First one of the season, plus one. <laughs> I know it might be a little bit later in the episode, but do we also get our first jelly baby? We do. <laughs> and coming from a doctor not known for it. It's one of those things where I know fans talk about jelly babies a lot, so I was like very surprised when he was like, jelly baby? Plus one to the jelly baby count. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I gotta admit, I kind of like the no admittance gag. Yeah. They had on the door, they could easily walk around. That made yeah. me laugh. Good. They wander around and eventually get captured and what have you. But meanwhile on Earth, Troughton builds some kind of gadget that doesn't work because he gets it wrong and agitates the creature instead. <laughs> which is just so typical Troughton. Oh, yeah. It really is. He also makes a rather sarcastic comment about television. Yes. Yes, he does, which is really funny because if you think back to the Troughton era... The number of times that the second Doctor is seen talking to someone through a television, peering out of a television, and yet here he's making sarcastic comments about them basically being mind-numbing. Mm -hmm. Love that. That was very, very smart humor. On the direction side, and I guess it's probably an element of scripting as well, I love the way it cuts back and forth between the two Doctors. Oh, I yeah. think that's a really, really neat narrative device to make sure they both get plenty of screen time. I really enjoyed it. From a set design perspective, the whole bedazzled <laughs> palace place is quite wonderful. I called it the blister base. <laughs> <laughs> it was shiny enough that I, I went down the bedazzled route, but I get I get it. Should the set designer be fired for that? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> a whole lot of other things could have happened, but I guess they wanted to match the creatures with the walls. And they did. They did a really good job with that. Yeah, since it all comes from Omega's deranged imagination. I have some questions about his mental health. <laughs> <laughs> well. If the things that came to his head were a barren wasteland filled with creatures that were covered with blisters. His mental health is as non-existent as his physical body. <laughs> <laughs> Accurate. Dr. Tyler, let's talk about him. Because as soon as they get into Omega's palace, he wants to leave. He agrees to stay. And then immediately tries to make a run for it, runs down a few corridors, runs into a gel guard, and then runs straight back to the doctor. That is an extreme case of padding. Completely and unnecessary. they call it out. They say, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> this story, I mean, it's so meta in that it frequently comments on the tropes of the show. There's something I meant to mention, but I didn't. And we're going to have to go back to the first episode. How dare you, sir? Our initial thing is unit being called in because there's a thing, right? Yep. Which then immediately turns into a base under siege with unit <laughs> being the base under siege. Uh-oh. Yes. <laughs> Are you about to say that the brigadier is so cranky he's a horrible boss? <laughs> I'm not quite going that far. All right. 
I think Omega would be a terrible boss if his gel guards <laughs> had anything to do with it. <laughs> They're unionized. It's fine. Oh, okay. Tyler runs away, comes back. When we flip back to the unit base, I believe that's when the second doctor and the brigadier talking about turning off the force field, and they're about to... Well, of course, it's only after an appearance of Hartnell, who right. mostly shows yeah. up just to drive the plot along. He's basically saying they're poking them when they're not thinking fast enough. He's like, hey, guys, you forgot about this thing. And they're like, oh, that makes sense. So he's just there to prod them along. But we get what I've been wanting for a long time is for actual unit crew to travel in the TARDIS. Yes. Yes. Brigadier and Benton. I've traveled in the TARDIS, and it makes me very happy. So does this now make them official companions? They're in multiple stories, and they travel in the TARDIS. I don't see why not. Uh, Benton is a companion! <laughs> Yay! We'll allow it. <laughs> the Brigadier and Benton. Yates. Mm, nah. Yeah, he missed no it. Yates. He missed it. He missed his chance. Damn you, Richard Franklin, and your theater commitment. <laughs> Thank you, Richard Franklin, and your theater commitment. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Shots oh. fired. The TARDIS, Unit HQ, and a few other things all travel through to the antimatter universe when the Doctor turns off the force field. The same corporal who said, Holy Moses is left looking very, very startled, and that's our cliffhanger, which leads us into episode three. I think one of my favorite things that was mentioned about why like the entire building went, because I actually made a comment at first. I was like, well, that's interesting. And then the doctor was like, oh, it just couldn't deal with the TARDIS itself and had to bring everything else with it. I was like, okay, that's the explanation. Very early on, I love Troughton's comment about having, and I think the quote is, had a great deal of respect for his advice and his being the first doctor. He's just basically patting himself on the back. I'm so wise. <laughs> it comes off as very respectful. And I, I think it, it was more Troughton talking about Hartnell. And I thought it was yeah. really sweet. Yes, they are the doctor. But as each doctor is different, I do think that even the doctor himself thinks of him as being kind of a different person in each of his incarnations. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yes. What I think is really interesting, and this is obviously the first multi-Doctor story, but we see it time and time again every time they do it. The younger the Doctor in his own time stream, so in this case, I mean the first Doctor, is always portrayed as the wisest, whereas you would think the older the character, so the more incarnations behind him, he would have accumulated more wisdom and be a bit more world-weary, I guess is the term I want to use there. They're going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> or I guess at this point, it's probably just a quarter life crisis. If that. <laughs> We're in the third episode. It's pretty clear we need to talk about the true star of the serial, Omega. Omega! Oh Steve Holt! Steve Holt! <laughs> oh, wow. <sighs> Before we get into it, I, since Don and I both just yelled Steve Holt, I do feel like I need to explain this for our listeners. When we were texting back and forth about this yesterday before recording, Don particularly noticed Omega's tendency to throw his arms up very much in the same style as Steve Holt from Arrested Development. And say his own name. You can tell he is a product of essentially being quarantined for so long. <laughs> the only thing he's had to survive on is chewing on the scenery, which he does in every scene he's in. Did anyone else, when they looked at his costume, just wish there was a scene of him, like, exiting a room and hitting his helmet on the door frame while walking out? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, that would have been so good. I adore that mask. I think it looks spectacular. It's very Greek tragedy, and there's an element of William Blake and his designs in there as well. I think it looks spectacular. But one thing I did want to mention is the actor who voices him and actually plays the body part as well, is Stephen Thorne, who we last saw as Azal in The Demons. Oh, <laughs> that's Azal. Okay. See, I thought that it was the person that eventually voiced Calculon from Futurama and had that same <laughs> over-the-top <laughs> kind of sense there. Nice. It's one of those interesting things where I really enjoy him as a character. It's so over-the-top. It's ridiculous. In any other story... It would have been like, man, this guy is just too much. <laughs> but you already have three doctors in here. So let's just turn it up some more. Turn it to 11. It's fine. We're going all in. Yeah. That's a good point, actually, because he, all that attention with Troughton, Hartnell, Pertwee, just that whole combination, 
you had to have a villain like that, or it would have just seemed so small. That's a good point. I actually yeah. agree. So, yeah. I mean, it is silly how he was, but probably was required. I almost wish the bad guy had been the master, just because I would love to see Delgado with Troughton. Oh, oh that's, that's it's something. nice to have a big dramatic villain. <laughs> I have a question for you guys on this. Omega adds to the Time Lord's lore. He's this solar engineer who the Time Lords consider to be their greatest hero. Basically, he detonated the star to trigger the supernova to give them the power to do everything they do. Okay, cool. Does this tell us too much about the Time Lords? The reason I ask is when we first met them in the war games, they were basically this race of godlike beings who could do whatever. And now we're starting to peel back the onion. Is that a direction they should have gone in or is it just revealing too much? We do find out that more and more lore comes along as we get through this because, oh, wow, 50 years. But I like it. I like an origin story. It's not quite an origin of like where their race came from, but it's an origin of how did we start this whole time travel thing? And honestly, it's going to be a question I ask you almost every time we get some major revelation about the Time Lords. You know, is this too much? I'll give this the seed and that I slightly disagree. I think right here, it's not necessarily too much. But as a general rule, I don't like learning too much about the Doctor's origin or Gallifrey because then it becomes about the Doctor in some way. Mm -hmm. And I prefer it when the Doctor is this agent that happens to other things. It's become this crutch that whenever they want to build attention, they'll make some dramatic change or revelation, and it just kind of annoys me. That's fair. I just think in this one, they didn't go that route, and it doesn't really tie back to the Doctor, really. So yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from, but... Luckily, in this instance, we didn't get that. But this one, I don't think it goes too far. I mean, it does make you wonder, well, if they could have just plucked him out of his time stream at any point and they were chasing him, why didn't they? And the only answer to me that I find satisfactory is that they really didn't care that much. <laughs> so once he called them, like, OK, we'll pick him up. But clearly he wasn't a priority. <laughs> it comes back to the fact that, as Julie keeps reminding us, the Time Lords are a bunch of dicks. Yes. I mean, that's true. One of my things right here is like, maybe Omega should win. The Time Lords are dicks. <laughs> 100%. That's a quote of mine. I knew you were going to bring that up. <laughs> to answer your question, Anthony, I think it is revealing too much because I don't like the idea. Now, granted, I know that, that horse left the barn a long, long time ago, but watching the show from the beginning, just trying to keep my knowledge limited just to what has happened so far, a revelation like that really takes away a lot of the aura of mystery of the Doctor. And it also starts leading down a path of something that I don't necessarily care for too much. And that is basically kind of giving the Doctor a Superman, you know, kryptonite. Like, well, if only we just did that, he wouldn't have had his power or he wouldn't have had his abilities. And I just think like when you start getting into a question of like, how to attack the character or how to do this. And you start getting into this kind of like comic book kind of mentality. I like what Don was saying, that he should be an agent of change. And he's a force of nature that comes in and affects characters that we will watch and see and grow. But when you start talking about, oh, and this is his secret weakness or things like that, I'm like, ah, oh, don't do that. Again, I see where you're coming from. I just don't think that this particular instance leads to that exact type of thing. I agree. I agree. It's just this is kind of where that seed was planted. Yeah, this is where, where it starts. <laughs> but I'm not complaining about this story because I really like the story. I think it works in the context of the story, but I agree. It kind of leads down the path where we get more and more revelations about Gallifrey that leads to, as Don says, the plot of the show eventually becoming more and more about the Doctor as opposed to that agent of change going in somewhere and changing the world for better. All right. I want to talk about fun things. Go back to the second Doctor and team have landed and there is sand everywhere. And he gets so excited. He's like, oh, <laughs> we're going to go to the beach. And I was just like, he likes the sand more than Anakin Skywalker does. <laughs> <laughs> I love how Benton just completely understands what's going on while the brigadier is struggling to <laughs> comprehend. He's talking about international repercussions and says, wait, so are we at Chroma? Yeah. <laughs> no, dude, you're not at the English seaside. 
no. uh, we, we can't have the place surrounded by holiday makers. Ah, <laughs> oh, it was so great. And then, you know, we got a oh my giddy aunt, uh, which I mm-hmm. love whenever Oh my giddy he... aunt. <laughs> it's so fun. I love Troughton. We also get reintroduced to Mr. Olis. Yes, the Brigadier meeting up with Mr. Ollis, the big Finnish spin-off that we don't want. <laughs> <laughs> what I find interesting is you guys called him a, a local yokel, but he's like the least yokel of the he local is. yokels that we've come across. His wife, who doesn't care that he disappeared, <laughs> is a bit more of the comedy yokel than yes. he is. Yeah. Yeah. He does get the comedic line to cap off the whole thing. Oh, yeah, Yeah. that's at the very end. We'll get there. So Lethbridge Stewart and Mr. Ollis plan on making a surprise attack on Omega's base. (laughs) Just the two of them, because the Brigadier has completely fucking cracked. (laughs) (laughs) With all of their resources, which I think is like, what, a rifle and like some sort of pistol or something? A service revolver, yeah. Okay. And a rock that I'm sure they could pick up. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I don't even know. It's fine. Everything is fine. This episode is also where we get the two doctors meeting back up. And I think where they finally click, you get the banter between them in the cell, each kind of trying to say the same thing. You get the two of them trying to deceive Omega. I think they are brilliant here. Pertwee and Troughton, I don't think works that well together in episode two. But episode three, absolutely. More of this, please. Absolutely. But my big thing is this fight that Pertwee has <laughs> at the very end of this episode. <laughs> I like certain elements of it and not certain elements of it. How they decided to depict Omega in this weird other consciousness or whatever, not great. I love the fact that they slowed things down and they didn't really use much music. There is some soundscape, but there's not a lot. So those aspects I liked. But the fact that I think the doctor got teabagged and was the little (laughs) spoon, didn't really need to see that. With the fight, let's not forget the director here, Lenny Main, also directed the fight in The Curse of Peladon. Okay, that's why I liked certain aspects of the fight then, because he did that. Okay. Welcome to WWE Who Wrestling Entertainment Smackdown. (laughs) By God, is that the first doctor coming into the ring with a rock? (laughs) God, I would have loved to have seen that if, oh, man. I was just, I mean, it was such a, like, classic wrestling thing. I just imagine, like, the other doctors, like, running in there, like, tag teaming and dropping elbows or something. (laughs) Before we get to that, they all get very excited about the singularity chamber. When we get there... It's just a vertical jet of steam. How goddamn disappointing. I think that's fine. I don't think you can go back to discuss that. We just had Julie talking about the third doctor getting teabagged. Fair. You can't go back to the disturbing special effect after we've crossed down that path, man. And I do want to point out in the run up to that fight, Omega does tell him that he shall have to fight the dark side of yes. my mind. Yes. Right. Apparently he plays a lot of D&D in his mind fighting an orc you know when you said that pertwee demanded that his character be given more attention than anyone else i couldn't help but think that this is like what they gave him like he loves all this macho bullshit let's give him this ridiculous fight at the end of episode three let's shoot it really weird and cool and see if that will like calm him down and you know what he probably loved that he's like yeah Yeah. make me look like i'm a badass I did some research on this whole thing, and this is going to sound like I'm insulting Pertwee. I'm not. I just think it's kind of funny. Apparently, he would kind of do things to the shots to make sure that he always was more in focus and more in frame than the guy playing Omega. (laughs) (laughs) That doesn't surprise me. It's like, oh, come on, man. You're the star of the show. You don't have to be petty like that. It's okay. He is the Shatner of classic who. I'm telling you. <laughs> I have a question on the fight scene, mostly because I didn't take a note of it. Did we get a Pertwee gun during that? No, I don't think so. No? Okay. Disappointing. No, but we got a teabagging. <laughs> keep forgetting that. I don't think we get enough of those in classic who for me to keep a running tally, though. <laughs> we end the episode with, firstly, the Time Lords wanting to send Hartnell in which is his one appearance in this episode. And then Pertwee basically losing the fight in the voiceover of those who oppose the will of Omega shall not live. Destroy him. Nothing in the world can stop me now. Uh, That will never be topped. (sighs) I I don't know. 
Oh, but it comes pretty close. I would like to nominate Omega for the camp count. Oh, yes. 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 Without a doubt. What are we going to give him? Five? Five. Five. Yeah. Five. Five. Good. Let's talk about episode four. The second Doctor comes to the rescue because, yay! I want to point out how ridiculous it looks when Pertwee is just like rolling around on the floor, struggling in his fight that you can't see. That was fun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then we get the famous rescue scene. What about we get that line of, think of a thing, rub that magic lamp, and shally me, gally me, zoop. There it is. <laughs> like, how do you say that without like pausing and being like, what, what am I saying? <laughs> He's just that good. And I love that Omega's reaction is, are you sure that you two are the same intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> so good. Well, that was the brilliance of the second Doctor, is that he worked to make everyone underestimate him. Mm -hmm. And of course, I love that what he's fundamentally doing is just testing the limits of Omega's self-control. He's being deliberately childish, deliberately obtuse to try and make him mad and lose control. It's so smart. And it's also here at the beginning where we get the actual Steve Holt moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do like some of the lines that Omega has when he talks about being the Atlas of my world. I just thought that was some really good dialogue considering that most of the time he's just over the top. Also, you combine that with his tragedy mask, and there's a very distinct classical influence at that point. You've got the mention of Greek mythology with Atlas. His name is Omega, for God's sake. I mean, this is all very Greek, kind of continuing that obsession from the time monster. And it's a good example of the mix of Greek tragedy and comedy, and it's just comedy because he's so <laughs> over the top with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we talked about how the science was questionable. We also have another addition to the doctor's tool belt, so to speak, the combining of our wills. Yeah, it's like a telepathy thing. Yeah, that's a new one. The epilepsy warning would have been handy <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah, that's not something we've seen the Time Lords or the yeah. Doctor be able to do before. It does get used again in future. Can't say I'm a fan of it. No, me neither. <laughs> I think later on he just bonks people in the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or the Vulcan mind meld that he does yeah. in uh, the Tenant era. I think we are getting to the point where we are understanding because we've made fun of Omega, but we don't really understand like what his goal is. And as we learn, one of the things is that he wants the doctors to replace him in his imprisonment, which I could not help but think how similar that was to the very end of the mine robber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, fundamentally, you've got someone who has created this realm based on their imagination and will. And to your point, Riley, he wants the doctor to take over for him so that he can go home. Right. It's 100% parallel. But unfortunately, he can't because he's the headless horseman. Yeah. I actually liked how they played that off because first they take the mask off and then they don't let the audience see it. And I was like, oh, man, like, I, what is it? Why can't we see it? And then they go through and actually show you that he just doesn't exist. And I thought that was actually a pretty good reveal. Yes, it I was. thought that it was very good. I have to admit, that's my horror background, I was a little disappointed. I wanted him to go to that mirror, and I wanted to see us something so messed up. <laughs> I wanted to be like, oh my god, that is disgusting. Here's some headcanon for you. Before his face disappeared, he looked an awful lot like his guards. He had a terrible skin condition. <laughs> That's why he started wearing the mask in the first place. His reaction is fantastic. I loved that ethereal howl that he lets out, that by the way, apparently Stephen Thorne did something even bigger than that, and they told him to tone it down because it wasn't appropriate <laughs> for uh, tea time on a Saturday. He knows that the key to a good scene is a dramatic pause. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. He also gets a few other great things. The I can create and I can destroy, so therefore I must exist. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty accurate. And then he just wants to destroy everything because he doesn't really exist. He's just thought, and that's kind of crazy. And this, of course, allows the Doctors to escape and get back to the TARDIS. We get the second Doctor running again. Yes. I love his run. <laughs> I forgot how much I loved it, and it was wonderful. What's interesting to me is you can tell that this is where in the original script Hartnell was meant to join them, because at the end of episode three, they talk about sending him through the black hole, and then here we find out they weren't able to do it. 
So clearly, if he was going to be able to actually be on set with them, this is where he would have come through. And this is when he would have joined them to fight Omega in the final confrontation. So he comes on on screen, talks them through some things. We get another instance of some ridiculous childish contraption that looks like it's held together with string. And that's what's going to save everybody. (laughs) With the recorder. Mm -hmm. (laughs) With the recorder. It's not even the contraption that does it. It's the recorder. That was just, again, one of those instances where I was like, I wish it was something a little bit more. I kind of liked it because the whole point was to get him to touch the recorder. And so they built a nonsense machine as a distraction. Yeah, I guess so. It's just uh, just the fact that we already had an episode where he built a childish machine that did something and they've done it again. That's where I kind of. Mm, That's fair. Yeah. I think the difference here is, though, it's deliberately meant to look kind of basic and cobbled together because it's meant to generate the what the hell is this reaction versus in the Time Monster where it was very clearly meant to be something a bit more serious and we all hated it because of that. (laughs) (laughs) So we get to the point where the doctors are telling all the others to go. Yep. After Pertwee has elicited a promise from Joe to do what he says. Oh, she follows for a minute. <laughs> I love how it's all this is like, no, absolutely not. And then Dr. Tyler is like, oh, the scientist is telling me what to do. Sure, I, I'm going to do it. So he goes, then all this goes. And then Benton is like, should I go? I want I want Joe to go first. He's like, I really shouldn't be going before Joe does. But then, you know, the brigadier is just like, go, Benton, go. And I was just like, that's so sweet. By the way, we do actually get an I'll explain later as well in this episode. When they're developing the mystery risky solution and Tyler asks the third doctor to tell him what they're doing, he just goes, oh, I'll I'll explain later. All words to that effect. I totally missed that. Good catch. Yeah. But Julie, back on point, that entire scene with everyone walking through the smoke felt very, very drawn out to me. I thought it was fairly drawn out. What I would have enjoyed better about it is if... Prouton didn't go back with them and Pertwee was the only one who did because then it would have been like a farewell to Troughton and then at least therefore it being dragged out a little bit would make sense. But yeah, I can kind of see your point. Finally, Joe goes second last and Lethbridge Stewart is the last. This is where we see the final showdown between the Doctors and Omega, which didn't last very long, (laughs) didn't last long and made the MacGuffin worthwhile. He accidentally destroys his own universe. By being so annoyed at the second Doctor. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's just fantastic, honestly. Oh, yeah. All right, let's talk about the goodbyes. Well, there's a lot of them, if you count the scene of everyone walking into the rather disappointing smoke effect. I'm thinking after that. The second round of goodbyes. We do say bye to Hartnell again, right? The first and second Doctors get sent back to their own time zones, and we get to a goodbye for them. Obviously... Lethbridge Stewart and Benton are sticking around, but Lethbridge Stewart orders Benton to help him inventory the HQ and make sure everything's been put back. (laughs) I really loved Benton's reaction, though. You sigh, Julie, but he's like, what do we say if something is missing? (laughs) And the Brigadier is just like, come along, just do it. My reaction isn't to what Benton says. It's more of the fact that the Brigadier is making Benton do more work when it's like, you know, you could give Benton a break and have someone else do that work, like Yates, who... He didn't do any of this. And so now he's like, well, you're fresh. You go do this. But, you know, that's besides the point. Yeah, but the brigadier has lost his mind at this point. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay, that's fairly accurate. I love how this is now headcanon accepted. (laughs) (laughs) He did lose his mind, but I wanted to point out, even though we had already passed the scene, the brigadier, I think, has one of the best delivered lines in the entire serial and where the second doctor only says, if only he could find his recorder, I could play a little something to pass the time. And then the brigadier, with just a great reaction, says, we must be thankful for small mercies. <laughs> <laughs> but the way, I mean, I, I don't do it justice. I don't do it justice because his facial expression and how he gives that line is so damn good. On that topic, Riley, I love when he first sees the second doctor and his reaction is, oh, no. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I mean, he may be going insane over the course of the story, but Nicholas Courtney's acting is on point. <laughs> you also get those lines like, I didn't know when I was well off. He's just so good. <laughs> we were talking about goodbyes. Do we want to talk about the best goodbye? Because it's at the very, very end. Let's do Mr. Ollis. Mr. Ollis, man. He goes home and his wife is like, where <laughs> have you been? He just sits there and he looks and he's like, 
you'd never believe me, woman. Supper ready? <laughs> like, it's fantastic. <laughs> yep. <laughs> He's just like, I'm going to forget everything that just happened. None of that exists. I'm just going to go have my dinner and just I'm going to sleep it off. It'll be fine. Yeah. I love that dynamic. I love that she clearly wasn't too fussed about him disappearing and <laughs> just his reaction <laughs> when he gets back. I mean, there's clearly um, not a huge amount of love between them. <laughs> the important thing that changes the dynamic of the show is just as Joe is consoling him about Omega's death, the Time Lord sent him a new dematerialization circuit and restore his knowledge of time travel. They decided that for a little bit of time, they're not going to be dicks. And to be fair, he did just save the entire universe. <laughs> <laughs> Their dickery knows no bounds! <laughs> nice. And that's more or less the end of the story. You know, we'll be heading off into time and space again on a regular basis, which I think we're all excited about. <laughs> Let's rate this bad boy. This time around, we start with Julie. There were a lot of things to like about the serial. It is four episodes, so it's straight to the point. It's not a lot of baggage. There's not a lot of unnecessary things there. You've got Troughton, who's still like peak. He's still wonderful. I love him. When they start really hitting it off, you get that episode three with the two of them, and it's phenomenal. Benton shines in this, I'm not going to lie, and I do love to see the Brigadier just go into a spiral. I really enjoyed it. I thought they did a really good job. And so I'm giving it eight tea baggings out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Riley, you're up next. This is a treat, but it certainly feels like the story takes a backseat to putting the Doctors together. The story isn't bad, it's just very, very basic. Omega is theatrical, but otherwise not interesting. The twist with Omega being already too far gone was, that was kind of interesting, but I don't think that was enough. This is one of those where the enjoyment primarily comes from all of the character interactions. Basically, give any excuse to get them together in a room. That's it. You know what? That's okay. It was an absolute pleasure to have that. But I just want a, l a little bit more story. And I want someone with that story and the character moments, you would have had something amazing. But still... An absolute pleasure. I give it seven and a half exploded pizza roll monsters out of ten. Okay, Don, let's go with you. When we rate these things, I'm generally the first person to talk about how the numbers don't matter because it's you've got that basis on, did they do what they set out to do? And did I enjoy it? I think they set out to make something that would make an excellent kickoff to a almost 10 year anniversary and celebrate the history of the program. And I think they wanted to just bring as many people as they could back and have some fun with it. As far as my enjoyment of it, I had a blast. It's cheesy in spots, but it almost enhances it. And I mean, this is so much fun. I'm giving it 3.3 eddies in space time per doctor. <laughs> wow. 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 Because it did what it set out to do. Technically, you gave it 9.99, .9, but we're going to round that yes. up to a 10. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. 9.99. <laughs> no, it's a 9.99. <laughs> okay. Well, I, that means I'm still the only one to have ever given a 10. But I was hoping you would join me, Don. Join me. <laughs> You'll probably round it anyway. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I'm rounding it. <laughs> this one was delightful. I think Don has pretty much already summed up my feelings. This one lacks substance. And I oh, alluded yeah. to that in my short summary. It does lack substance, but that doesn't stop it from being really, really fun and really, really enjoyable. Seeing three doctors on screen together, even if Hartnell is clearly ailing, was just an absolute joy. Seeing interactions between Troughton and Benton, Troughton and the Brigadier again, wonderful. We got a lot of tropes of the show that are kind of brought up again, whether it's base under siege, whether it's the Brigadier and Benton and, and the interactions, whether it's the Doctor peering out from TVs and making jokes about that. It feels like a celebration, which is what it's meant to be. And I can't hate it at all. I can't bring myself to give it anything less than eight and a half of the Brigadier's computers out of ten, <laughs> which gives us a story average of 8.5, which is the highest season opener since the Tomb of the Cybermen. Let's hope the rest of the season is this good, eh? We can only hope. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, 
you guys. We're scared. We're scared. We've been burned before. Whenever you say, I can't wait to see you guys think of the rest of it, it's usually because it's crap. <laughs> no, I, I think this season is very, very strong, genuinely. So I, I am actually curious from a perspective to see whether you guys agree with me or whether Don finds it slightly disappointing like he did in Inferno. <laughs> Never letting that go. No, no, ne neither will I. <laughs> Blue fucking werewolves. What the hell? All right. And with that, we are sadly out of time. We will be back next time when we are going on our first adventure with the Doctor, free to go wherever the hell he wants in Carnival of Monsters. But as always, thank you very much for listening and have a good one. You have been listening to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension with Don Smith, Riley Shrek, Julie Philpack, and myself, Anthony Williams. This episode, Doctor Who and the Other Two, was recorded on Wednesday the 2nd of February 2022. If this is your first time listening into the show, all of our previous episodes are available wherever you like to get your podcasts. You can interact with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at, at watchers 4 d and you can also email us at watchers4d at gmail.com. If you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe and consider leaving us a review or rating on your favorite podcasting app. All of those things really do help the show. And always remember, if you're a hero of your entire species, just enjoy your status and don't do anything to jeopardize it, particularly if you no longer have a physical body.